you for this opportunity just to come before you, Lord, and just have you in our presence. Thank you for that, and thank you for just being involved in our lives. And thank you for giving us uh, your word, Lord, so we can have something to dig into and something to um, speak into our hearts, something that's alive and meaningful and purposeful. We ask that what we, what we learn tonight does those things in our hearts, Lord, to allow us to go into the battlefield and allow us to have these relationships with people that um, we can be bold, we can be courageous, we can be stepping out in faith for you. Um, I just ask that uh, you go before the message here, and especially just with me, Lord, just with the distractions and the attack that's been abundant, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you for those times that uh, you get a shine and uh, just ask that you just fill this room with your Holy Spirit, especially this message, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, pretty crazy week, I guess, in a way. Um, I, my first three chapters, or yeah, were going pretty smooth or whatnot. You know, I was uh, just getting filled up, and, you know, attack was coming here and there, but it was super exciting. But um, the more I start reading about battles and the more I start reading about uh, just who people are, right? The Bible's full of people and our fallibilities and our desires to want to follow the Lord, and then the voices come in our head, or the person says something funny, or the person cuts us off, or oh, gosh, you name it. The health inspector calls and says, you have to do this, this, or that, and it's just, man, it comes in the weirdest, weirdest ways, and it, what it does is it puts that burden on you, and it takes your focus away from what God wants you to do in the present, um, and so if we reflect back on the verses that we just, excuse me, the chapters that we just got uh, done covering, right? So David's uh, taking back the kingdom for the Lord when he was told he couldn't uh, build the temple. So he's still doing his part, right? He's collecting all the items. He's getting everything together for the Lord, doing really well. Remembers his promise with his good old buddy, Jonathan. Does he have, is anybody left from that household? Hey, he has a son over here. He finds his, he brings his son back, uh, raises him up into a place of prominence. And what a beautiful story about how the Lord works in our life, right? Um, God sent his son, Jesus, for us to get us in our sin and to raise us up if we're willing to fall on our face and become a servant. Uh, moving forward into uh, chapter 10, right? David's still in his, his mode of kindness. He's, he's on a peak, you know. He's really just on a roll here. And I know how it is in my life. You know, I can be, when the times are good, it's good. And you feel like you're just, let's, let's go on to the next one and keep blessing, right? And you're, you're winning all these victories for God. And what we're finding is in uh, ver, uh, chapter 8, 9, and 10, these are going to be similar stories. It's so crazy to see. It's Here we have David showing kindness to his uh, person from his own, let's say, household, right, a Jew. And this person decides to accept that grace, and he's lifted up into a place of prominence, right, prominent, uh, just how Jesus did with us, right? And now we're, now we're seeing in verse 10, David's now going to... Uh, uh, show his hand of kindness to uh, the king of the Ammonites, right, which aren't his people that were actually an enemy of Saul, but he's still reaching out to, let's call it the world, right? And so he sends his servants, just like the apostles were sent, right? So Jesus sends his servants out, and what do they do? They go in to bring gifts. They want it, they want, right? We have a gift, or these apostles have gifts, right? And to talk about the New Testament, and here we are in the Old Testament, these guys go, and the, the 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 new king gets these whispers in his ear about oh, they're 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 not here for us. They're here to spy on the kingdom and to take it over. And because they probably knew David from a while ago, you know, your past stays with you. You know, that was a really cool thing that popped up for him. I was like, wow. Sure, David might be doing being this conquering king and doing all these things for good, but they may have remembered the David that was the guy running with the Philistines. You know what I'm saying? So your past. We'll stay with you, and there's nothing you can do with it. You have to move forward, right? People might remember you. Right? I've, I've seen people come in here in church, and, oh, that guy used to be an alcoholic or a, a meth head or whatever. He can't be. Right? He can't be saved. He must not be. You know, he's probably just showing. Or You know you know how we get as people, just like these princes uh, that were supposed to be this wise counsel for this, this new king, Right? And we can start hearing the whispers and everything, and that's what I was getting beat up on this um, this week, was just these little whispers. You can't go up to it, man. You didn't, I, you didn't do enough studying. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And you start thinking and wondering and whatnot, and you allow the enemy to start creeping in because you're not taking things uh, captive, right? Um, 
And so what they have is the, 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 he believes the princess and he believes what they're saying. And uh, he basically humiliates David's servants, cuts off their beard. And it was funny because I was actually going to cut off half of my beard to show. I, I, I'm not even kidding. I was, I was, I was. And I thought, okay, but I have to stand up here for the next however long. And then it was like, then I have to go to work. Anyways, so just pretend, right? So totally humiliating, knowing that when you cut off a Jewish man's beard, that's A, humiliates them. Um, it's basically, uh, they were telling David, they look at him, these guys like slaves, um, you know, and it's basically a, an act of war. Uh, so um, let's get moving forward here, because that was, uh, we're going to uh, cover uh, chapter five, but uh, I, I wanted to cover one more thing. Excuse me. I said, even though even though when we do something for the Lord or these men were doing something for the Lord, right, we're, are we going to be persecuted, right? We see it more and more nowadays. Uh, when we step out for the Lord, expect the persecution, expect the fact that it might not be a cutting off of the beard, but it might be a slander of the name. It might be other areas in our life, and we're seeing this on a global scale, that we the church is, is becoming more persecuted, and it's it's having that faith enough to step out. Um, all right, I wanted to talk uh, real quick about uh, a verse that spoke to me about this. It's Matthew uh, 5, chapter 5. That's uh, verse 11 through 12. And this is, this is really cool to know here. It says, Blessed are you when, you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they, pers they persecuted the prophets who were before you, right? So we see these examples. Um, so that's, that's a call to you guys to be bold in that, right? You're only, you're only going to be persecuted unless you step out, right? I only, I, I only got, the, more tech, the, the more studying I do, the more attack that comes my way. If I wasn't studying, I don't think it would have been like that, you know? But I'm okay with that, right? That's oh, totally okay. So when the attack comes your way, rejoice in it. Be thankful for it. What are you going to learn from it, right? Um, and we're going to see here uh, uh, how David responded to this attack. So we're going to go into verse 5 now, and this is where we started in chapter 10. Verse 5. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards may be grown, and they return. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, reading some of the commentaries on this because some of these uh, uh, books aren't as familiar. I'm not as familiar with them as I am certain New Testament or whatnot. So by digging into these, you really get to see like a historical perspective or really how these customs were. Uh, I, I pulled Matthew Poole's commentary, and it says he sent to meet them, right? He, so, so he sent them clothes and other necessities. Uh, the Terry at Jericho. Right, both because this this was of the first places which they came to in Canaan, and because it was now a very obscure village, and therefore fittest for them in their circumstances, for it was not built as a city to after this time. Right, so it gave them a place to kind of hide out that was kind of desolate to some degree. It was kind of on their way. What I really like, I like that David came to meet them in their circumstances. Right? The king could have just sent, and we're going to see, he sends people left and right. Joab, go do this. So-and-so, go do this. But no, I think he understood the severity of it, Right, that these are his servants, the fact that these beards are cut off, and their tunics, I mean, to the, to the point where their buttocks were exposed, and these guys didn't wear underwear back in the day. So, I mean, that's super embarrassing, right? So he gives them, hey, he comes to meet them. He's going to bring him clothes, right? He's going to give them a place to stay. And I, wrote, I said, I love that David met them where they were, and gave them new clothes and a time to heal, right? Gave them a place to heal. I said, I'm thankful that we serve a king, right? Our Lord, that meets us where we're at, especially in our time of shame. Gives us new clothes and comfort when we've been beaten up by the world, right? Uh, I, I know that's probably my biggest thing if I'm in a place of shame. And, and shame can come in many different places. It can be self-imposed, can be imposed um, from without. But knowing that, you know, God will meet us where we're at and give us, give us that comfort, um, I thought that was a wonderful example of, of David's grace here. Um, we're going to move on to chapter uh, 6 through 8, and we're going to read 6 all the way through 8 here. Verse 6. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Mahak, 1,000 men, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men, 
And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering of in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and Rehob and Ishtob and Mahak were by themselves in the field. Uh, what a very interesting word that the fact that they saw that they stank, right? Uh, it says that the Hebrew trans, uh, translated literally shows that they were conscious that this was by their own fault that they had made themselves stink, right? I mean, I, and I thought about this, you know, sometimes if when I know that I stink, it's, you know, you kind of smile like, uh-oh, like you're offensive to people, you know, like you, you, you messed up, you should go somewhere, maybe wash, right? And the fact that, which I found interesting, hey, they're, they're going to come and, and uh, spy on the city and do all this stuff. But just in case they're not, let's take off their robes and cut off their beards because now they're, we're really going to start it, right? And once they realize their mistake, they could have they asked forgiveness for that mistake, right? And moving forward, this is, this is where we see the parallels of the story. You're going to start seeing you can make a mistake and ask for forgiveness for that mistake, or you can make a mistake and keep trying to cover your tracks and keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is what they're doing, man. They're, they're digging so deep that they're, they're going to try to win the war but you know, end up being taken down. And like I said, I said, what a, what a strong word to use for realizing one's actions in this case, a sinful action against the king. Instead of asking for forgiveness for this sin, the children of an Ammon, they doubled down on their decision, leading to much bloodshed and loss. So it was, uh, and that's what I said in the next chapter, we'll see David taking matters into his own hand and trying to solve a sin problem instead of asking the Lord for forgiveness. So I did find it interesting that, the, um, that once again, these guys would um, double down and not ask for David's um, forgiveness, right? Because he's, he's in a mode of kindness. They could have said, oh man, we're really sorry we messed up. Maybe it wouldn't have been as bad. Uh, but this, what this does is it shows me that actions speak louder than words, right? So... Uh, that's why we are encouraged to find that godly counsel, right? To, to A, fill, fill our lives with that godly counsel, but then the fruit of our tree, the action of our lives is what, is what we're, people are looking for. We can say all the things we want, but until we actually uh, act in the manner that's accordingly, right, we're, we're going to be uh, called a, a false witness. So I said, I find comfort in knowing that in spite of all the persecution and how it seems like evil people in the world um, or getting away with these actions, right? Um, I, I, I turn to Romans 12, 19, right? Because we're seeing this left and right. It just seems like in their case too, right? You have the servants being beat up, the Ammonites starting to try to war, um, the servants, you know, probably here in a shameful spot. They, they almost seemed overwhelmed. Uh, it says in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to, uh, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, "Vengeance is mine; I will repay," says the Lord. And that's just an encouragement too. When you guys are getting beat up by the world, or you guys are getting your tunics or your beards ripped off in a metaphorical speaking, uh, that you remember that God's in control and He's gonna He's gonna come and win that battle for you. It might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but. He's going to give you that place of comfort. He's going to give you that place where he's going to meet you at. And he, and he does. He, he, in a sense, he gives us those new clothes with, you know, renewing our spirits, right? Um, and, you know, especially with all the chaos in the world today, it just seems like, man, it's, it's somewhat chaotic. Um, it's a bit disappointing because, man, it just seems like it constantly keeps going downhill. But knowing that, you know, the, the, the victory has already been won and that, uh, right, God's in control here and that uh, vengeance will be his. So um, it says, in, right, put in chapter 8, David was on the attack. Now we see the enemy is back on the attack, but this time they're rounding up a huge army. Um, they even paid mercenaries, right? So they're, they're calling all, the, all these guys to come together to fight the big battle. Um, because, I, you know, when you poke the bear, you poke the bee's nest, you know, it's, you better expect something to happen. Um, and so uh, these guys are now going to start paying Syrians to help them out. The Ammonites are going to start paying Syrians to help them out, should really start trying to fortify their, um, their forces here. So, but, I put, but David is ready in heaven, the mighty men, and well-seasoned in war, and with the Lord giving him victory um, wherever he goes. Uh, I want to cover verse 7, and it's, an, it's another commentary. Um, it said, And when David heard of it, of the preparations made by the Ammonites... 
right? It's, it says, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men. Uh, and this is covering verse 7. He said, he sent out Joab, his general, and an army under his command consisting of men of strength, valor, and courage, or all the host of mighty men. As Kim Chi and Ben Melek, the famous mighty men mentioned in 2 Samuel 23, 8. He did not think it was advisable to wait for the Ammonites, but carried the war into their own country. And instead of suffering them to invade his dominions, he invaded theirs. And what 2 Samuel 23, 8 states, um, it talks, it's going to tell us who these mighty men were, one of the mighty men. It says, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph, uh, Bashibeth, the Tekamite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Enzanite because he had killed 800 men at one time. Um, I, I, had, I pulled up this, um, this visual of who these mighty men were because I was like, well, who are these guys? And it's, I don't have enough time to go into it. That's a whole other four studies. Um, but super exciting. Basically, you know, these guys were rounded up from different tribes and you think, well, mighty men, yeah, it's because they did all these war together and they kept just, you know, shining and following the Lord and winning these battles. And I think of it like when I get freshman basketball players, they're at a certain level, but we keep growing these men and they start, they start becoming pretty dang good basketball players through practice. And we, as we see, they've had a lot of practice. And the fact that, right, because one of them killed 800 men at one time, it sounds crazy. I, some of these things, I mean, the list just went on and on um, to where these guys are killing giants and doing all these wonderful things. And what that did, what it did, was showed me that anything's possible with the Lord, right? And I don't like to say, in your life, there's giants and you can slay them and everything, but we got to look at it from that perspective. What I realized through these teachings is that battles are shown in the Old Testament to show you tactical warfare and show you how men battle the enemy in their lives, right? So what is your battle? And I don't, you don't need to get all crazy, but I'll say, for example, we, I know people in my life that are battling cancer, and that is, that is causing them great pain and anguish. But what's that doing? It's turning them to the Lord. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the coolest thing about the battles. Because if you don't turn to the Lord, you're going to lose, right? Period. Because you're going to get beaten down and turned over and gossiped about, and the enemy is amazing at their tactics. But, and we're going to see later on moving in these verses, when you're courageous and you put your faith in the Lord and you go into battles knowing that he is your captain, right? That, that should be all the strength you need. So we'll, we'll move on here. Um, on uh, verse 8, excuse me, um, if we want to pop verse 8 back up again, if we can. So it's at the entering of the gate. Um, so the Ammonites and their allies formed separate armies, uh, the former taking their stand immediately before the city, and the latter by themselves at some distance, where the ground is more favorable and, and uh, maneuverable for their chariots, right? So they're setting up their armies here at the gates. They're getting ready for battle. Um, you know, uh, the same, uh, different battles, same story, right? These guys don't learn their lessons. Uh, so let's move on to verse 9 through 12. And so what you're going to find, guys, how I like to do this is I, I'll, I'll read a big chunk of chap, uh, verses and I'll jump back and forth. So if it's a little bit confusing, forgive me. But kind of keep, keep your finger on these 9, to, 9, 9 through 12, right? And um, that way you can jump back and forth. Uh, so verse 9. When Joab saw that the battle line was against him before, uh, before and behind, right? So there's the battles in front, and it's behind. He's surrounded, right? He chose some of Israel's best and put them in the battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, that he might set them in battle array against the people of Ammon. Then he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come in and help you. Be of good courage, courage, excuse me, and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in His sight. Well, surrounded by the enemy, observing, right? Hey, uh, you're going to take care of these guys. I'm going to take care of these guys, right? Game plan. Of course, I'm just paraphrasing stuff here. So I, I wrote in verse 9, 
When Joab saw that the battle line was against him, right be, be in front and behind, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in front of him, right? So he's getting those mighty men like, you know, it's a smart tactic. Let me get the guys that can kill 800 guys one by himself. So what you guy, you're going to take those 800, this other guy, right? It, I mean, what a, what a, that's why you could be so, so bold besides having the Lord, man, you know, who's behind you. Um, the, uh, one of the um, commentaries, the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges, it wrote that, that the front lines of battle was against, against him, excuse me, against him before and behind, right? So the Ammonites were posted in front of the city, the Syrians on the, uh, uh, on the plain opposite to them. If he attacked either forces separately, his rear would be exposed to the other. His choice of the picked men to attack the Syrians and his taking command of this division in person indicate that the mercenary troops were the most formidable part of the Ammonite force, right? Because they're paid mercenaries. This is what they do, man. This is the, they're, they're paid warriors. So he's smart. He's like, okay, I'm going to take these guys who are a lot more experienced. Um, all right, brother, you go over here. If it starts getting a little bit crazy, I'll co I'll, if you start losing, I'm going to come help you. And if I start losing, you come help me. And I thought that was really cool because that's a game plan. I think sometimes we can go into spiritual warfare and think, I can do this, I can do that. But we need a plan, right? Uh, and this is something that popped in my head because as I've been going through the studies, I'm kind of learning, I, I, let's call it structure, let's call it a plan, let's call it, I don't know, being a better soldier, being a better warrior. Um, certain things are brought to my attention about like, hey, this is kind of, you know, maybe a really good way to follow so I can help with the flow of stuff and all that. And I'm like, yeah, that's really good. And it gives me confidence, right? So I thought about when um, uh, Joab was talking to his brother, just that, hey, this is what we're going to do. Okay, if this happens, uh, I'm going to help you out. And if this other thing happens, I'm going to help you out, right? And it's, yeah, we're on the same page. Let's do this, right? So when you're in the midst of a battle and you have, let's say, a spouse, share with them like, hey, I'm, I'm confronted with these armies or this battle. If I'm struggling in this area, if you see me going outside and being secretive or not coming home at the right time or being on the internet too long, hey, come help me out. I'm getting beat up. And if I see you in those certain areas, you come help me out. Right? So that's the encouragement I see here is that we, when we go into these spiritual battles, we need that game plan in the sense to where we're reaching out to those that are like-minded warriors in the church, right? spouses, friends, to help us, right? Because the battle will come from the front and behind. Because guess what? They're gonna, the, distract, the battle comes here and the attack comes here, right? It never comes here straightforward all the time. Um, so in verse 10, right, it says, And the rest of the people um, he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, that he might set them in battle array against the people of Ammon. Uh, another um, uh, commentary, it says, And the rest of the people he delivered into the hands of Abishai, his brother, who was a commander under him, and a very valiant man. And thus, as his enemy had two armies, he divided his into two parts, that he might be the better, right, be better to attack them, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon, draw them up to the line, place them in rank and file to meet the, meet the children of Ammon and give them the battle. So once again, we see a well-seasoned general leading the armies against a, num a numerous foe, right? Joab's been there, done that. Um, you know, the, the, the battles all around. This shows us how experienced David's, David's mighty men have become through all the wars and battles fought over the years. Joab's keen eye to decipher the battlefield and uh, to relay a game plan shows us the skill of his leadership. Joab understood the Syrians were much more skilled, right, being a paid mercenary, um, and because they're also seasoned warriors. So he had his brother take care of the Ammonites and Joab against the mighty Syrians. Uh, and like I said, what a great pregame speech. I, wrote, I know as a coach what confidence I give my team when I'm prepared with a game plan, and I give them words of encouragement and motivation, right? So that's an encouragement for the week. If you're struggling in certain areas, start writing out a game plan. Start praying. Start filling your life with those affirmations. And not, I'm not saying claim it and name it. I'm saying read it and believe it, right? Read what the Word says and believe it and act in that manner, uh, and to me, the best part is in chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 12. Be of good courage, right? 
and let us not be strong for all, for uh, let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in His sight. Man, that's amazing. I I looked up Deuteronomy, and I, this is I didn't tell you about this one. So it's Deuteronomy uh, chapter thirty one. <laughs> Uh, verse 6, so I want to wait a little bit on that. Um, right, be of good courage. That's exciting. And, and why? Why be of good courage? Because who's behind him? Who's always behind him? Right, the Lord. So Deuteronomy 6, or excuse me, um, 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So that is your verse for the week, okay? In the youth group, they do the verse for the week. That's your verse for the week. So that's something you have to practice in your brain, okay? And when you are confronted with the battle, and it could be small, you need to speak that. Be of good courage, okay? And like we were saying, right, the Lord, he, he goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. That's crazy, because we sometimes we feel that way, don't you think? When he's not right there and we're not filled with the Spirit, life's going good. Sometimes we feel empty and lost, but we need to show up to the battle like Joab, right? And this is where I got the attack was from all this week. was like, man, I was struggling in certain areas, not sleeping, working really long hours, and I thought, just show up to the battle, right? And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. That's what it is. So Okay, Lord, do what's good in your sight. Allow this to speak forward. And I'm going to have errors. There's going to be stuff I don't say right or verses that are mixed up, but I don't care, right? Show up. Be of good courage. Um, And like I said this, this should be our battle cry for our daily affirmation, right? That verse. That we come to the cross daily and fight the spiritual battle in the name of the Lord and fighting for his people, right? I thought that was pretty cool about the verse, fighting for his people. For the city of God. What's your city of God? Gridley, or where you work. That's your city of God and for the people, right? Not just your church, but those that you come into contact with, right? So be of good courage. Pray for your city. Reach out to the people that you come in contact with, right? Because uh, God is, uh, right, like it says, and may the Lord do what is good in his sight. That's a beautiful verse. So so Joab and the people, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 13 through 14. So Joab and the people who were with him, drew near for the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai and entered the city. So Joab returned from the people of Ammon and went to Jerusalem. Um, it's a couple of verses that re- uh, came to mind when reading that. James 4, 7, right? Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, Right? So they're submitting to the Lord, coming to the battle. They're resisting the army. And what do they do? Take off, right? How do we, right? And I said, how do we do this? Just something to to think about moving forward. And we'll talk about that. So second verse of this portion, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. I hope this is the right one. I'm going to read it here. For we walk through, we walk for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments of every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and uh, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Right? Job is submitting the battle to the Lord, but is showing up in faith and resisting the enemy, and guess what? They fled. These verses show me the difference between a warrior led by God and a, and a paid mercenary, right? So Job shows up led by God, standing firm, a paid mercenary for money, doing things for money. He's out, right? This can be in our own personal lives by taking a job or a position for money instead of where God has called you. I think of the churches and the different types of pastors, right? I think of the uh, someone called and led by God, right, which, which we have in our church, and maybe somebody in a different church that what we, what we call a hireling, they just show up and they're paid to teach a message, right? Taking the job for money. Uh, John 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 12 through 13. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf come in and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. 
the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Right? And we see a perfect example of that. When you do stuff for selfish reasons or just for money, there's no purpose behind that. There's no victories there. It's short-term gain. Um, let's move on to uh, verses 15 through 19. When the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered together. Then Hadadezer sent and brought the Syrians who were beyond the river, and they came to Helam. And Shobak, the commander of Hadadezer's army, went before them. And when it was told to David, he gathered all of Israel, crossed over the Jordan, and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. Then the Syrians fled before Israel. And David killed 700 charioteers and 40,000 horsemen of the Syrians and struck Shobach, the commander of their army, who died there. And when all the kings, were, and when all the kings uh, who were servants to Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Ammon anymore. Man, that's pretty powerful. Right, let's, let's, let's round up the troops, and now David's getting involved. Now David's like, oh, okay, it's time to bring in the big guns, right? I love that he gathered all of Israel. That means they were of one accord, right? That's pretty cool. I mean, to have your kingdom of that mindset, to know, like, we are protecting this place, right, to cross over into their territory and to heal them, that, that's, pre that's pretty cool. And to see what, uh, what damage can be done, especially that we know wherever David went, the Lord gave him victory, I wrote, uh, after this retreat by the Syrians, from Joab, right? So they, Joab and his brother, they see them together and they take off, cowards, of course. But what are they going to do? Oh, we need more troops. We need more troops. Let's gather them together, right? They, they, they want to get together for another battle. How, and that's how the enemy works, right? When we think we have this battle won here and we're excited and sometimes God will act miraculously in our life and the battle can be won like that, we're going to see just moving forward that this next battle, you got to fight. Okay, so there's going to be battles in your life that you need to show up to, and God's going to be do miraculous work, but don't expect that, right? You need to show up to the next battle because guess what? The enemy is going to be right there, and we're going to see that they had to fight. David had to step up and finally, finally battle these guys and take out what what, what was it? Seven hundred, uh, yeah, seven hundred charioteers, forty thousand horsemen. That's crazy. Those numbers are unreal. But we know with the mighty men, that was probably just not that big of a deal. Uh, right? They had a united front, even summary, and the, the top commander show back. I mean, they were getting the big guns, you know, and I love that they, they mentioned that they brought this guy forward because it's showing, like, they're bringing the top of the top, right? And uh, this is just another battle tactic the enemy uses for spiritual battle, right? We, we may have defeated the enemy, right, as we covered before, but they're always going to be uh, ready for another one. But when David heard of the Syrians regrouping, he took all of Israel and took the fight to Hillam. Once again, we see strong leadership from David, knowing that he was up against what he was up against in gathering the necessary troops. This time, the Syrians tried to hold their ground and fight, but the Lord behind David's formidable army, um, the, the Syrians were no match, to the point that after many lives were lost, a surrender and a peace treaty was made. And just like the battles before, the enemy was conquered, and lasting impact was made because the Syrians wouldn't help the Ammonites anymore for money. So that tells you that was a, a pretty uh, definitive defeat, um, that these guys wouldn't even help them anymore, even, even if they were offered it. Because it, the, the sum of money, I guess, was pretty absorbent. Um, but that shows you um, how definite that defeat was and you know, uh, how serious that was that they were coming against you know, the Lord's, well, David's servants, right? Um, and I said, to summarize this chapter from an, inter from an uh, external position, I see a man sinning, right? The new king. I think his name was Hanan. Forgive me if I'm wrong, right? Against someone trying to show him kindness. And instead of asking for forgiveness, the new king tries to eliminate the sin problem by attacking and murdering, right? Humiliating, doing, trying to figure out the next step to remedy this. Instead, the king caused great pain and death throughout his kingdom and his household. I bring this situation up because we're going to see in a very similar story in the next chapter where a king, via his sin and lack of repentance until, uh, until much death and anguish came upon his household. 
He tried to remedy his mistake by scheming and planning to the point of premeditated murder. So that's just, I don't know, what is that foreshadowing? Is that, what we're, is that the word? I don't know. But this is an example of, right, a man of the world making these decisions, and this is where it's leading to, and we're going to see moving forward almost the same thing. And this, is, this has been the craziest thing with these chapters. It's like, these are, they're all kind of the same story. God saying, do this. Man saying, yes. Man being blessed. God saying, do this. Man saying, no. Man not being blessed. And Right? I do that. When I'm blessed, life's good. But guess what, God? I'm going to take the reins. I got it from here. I appreciate it. And there I go, right? Doing my own thing. And I want, I'm going to leave this uh, as we end here, this noise here. It's a knock of the door. Mephibosheth got that knock, right? He was summoned by the king, okay? Hanan got that knock. It was the servants, right? And we're going to hear that same knock with Bathsheba, Okay? We all have different callings. We all have different powers. We all have different things in our lives that we can impact people's lives. But unless we are doing it with kindness, with grace, and uh, with love, and and if we do make mistakes, right? Because they could, the Hanan and them could have repented and asked for forgiveness, and they wouldn't have lost this battle like that. Maybe not at that time. So, if you guys are struggling with these areas in your life, stop. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to. Uh, solve your sin problem, right? Fall down at your face, come back to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, right? So um, I'm going to pray real quick because I just, God's been kind of calling me to do this because if anybody's watching and they've never asked the Lord into their heart, um, I'm going to give them a chance to do it. Um, So let's just bow before the Lord and pray real quick. Lord, just once again, thank you for, this is teaching. Thank you for showing us um, just the examples of kindness and the examples of persecution and just courage and all these different examples of men, but the fact that you are faithful in all of this, that you are the true leader, that you are our courage and our strength, Lord, help us to grab towards that and help us to be bold in those areas and to remember that verse in Deuteronomy, Lord, and allow that to be our our verse for the week. Um, But if there's anybody out there watching, Lord, that's never um, asked you to come into their hearts, Lord. I, I pray that uh, uh, you speak to them right now um, and that we, we come to faith through our heart by believing in you in our hearts and speaking it with your mouth, Lord. And if anybody's out there, if you're believing that in your heart, now is the time to speak it with your mouth, to put it out there. Um, so if, if that is something that um, you want to do, uh, we're going to say a quick prayer for that. And Lord, uh, we ask that if anybody's there having that Holy Spirit speak to them, Lord, and if they want to accept you, God, uh, allow that relationship to start growing. I pray that uh, you call them to uh, come to a Sunday service or to reach out via online and that you put it on the hearts of us to be um, uh, just a uh, sowing of the seeds and harvesters, Lord. The challenge for us, Lord, is believers here at this church. Help us to 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 uh, grow those individuals out there. Once again, Lord, just thank you for your word and just how amazing it is. And allow those seeds that were planted today to grab root and uh, help us uh, just in our daily lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.